You know, Jesus did prophesy the destruction of Israel. But Luke describes the same scene as Matthew, but in more detail. He says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in thy day, the things which would belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. That's Luke uh, 19, 41 through 44. So it was only 30 or 40 years after the prophecy of Jesus that of course the Roman armies came and camped around Jerusalem and in 70 AD they invaded the city and burnt the temple to the ground. Well, then in 135 AD the Roman emperor Hadrian totally banned Jews from living in Jerusalem. And this began almost 2,000 years of Jewish exile from the Temple Mount and the city of which, remember, God had said, I will put my name there forever. He didn't say, if Israel goes into exile, I'll take my name from there. He just said, I will put my name there forever. Now, during the time of exile, devout Jews prayed three times each day with their faces turned towards Jerusalem that God would forgive their sins and return the Jews to the promised land. It became a, a custom at Jewish weddings for the groom during the ceremony to crush a glass under his heel. And this was to indicate that on this happiest day of his life, he could not be completely happy since the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. And throughout the exile, when Jews parted from one another's company, it became their custom to conclude their goodbyes with next year in Jerusalem. So, after Hitler's horrible holocaust, the United Nations decided it was time to give Jews a place that they could call home. On November 29, 1947, the United Nations voted to partition the Holy Land in two nations, into two nations, in Israel and Palestine. And the world body decided that Jerusalem would be declared an international city. Now, who's the international 
uh, community to decide that. God said, no, it's given to the children of Israel. I will put my name there forever. Remember, the promised land was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through that lineage forever. And yet the international community says, well, we're going to make Jerusalem an international city and that it would be placed under the United Nations control? Well, the Arabs refused the partition plan and they launched a war to destroy the newborn nation of Israel. And Israel had accepted it and declared independence on May 14, 1948. The Arabs said, no way, not going to happen. So when a ceasefire was declared in 1949, Israel controlled West Jerusalem and Jordan occupied East Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount, and Israel immediately adopted Jerusalem as its capital, even though they didn't have the entire city. But when the 1967 Six Days War broke out, Jordan launched an attack against Israel. Well, of course, Israel counterattacked, drove Jordan out of, the, out of Jerusalem, back across the Jordan River, and that's when Israel conquered the eastern portion of Jerusalem and took the Temple Mount, 1967. Well, then in 1980, Israel officially annexed East Jerusalem and declared the city to be Israel's undivided capital. On August 20th, 1980, the United Nations adopted Resolu Resolution 478, in which it reiterated its position that all actions altering the status of the city were null and void, and called upon states that had established embassies in Jerusalem to withdraw them. And subsequently, all nations placed their embassies in Tel Aviv, bowing to the will of the United Nations. You know, the United Nations recognizes every chosen capital of each of its member states, except one, and that's Israel. Well, the U.S. Congress decided the injustice of this situation should no longer be tolerated. Both houses of Congress overwhelmingly passed the Jerusalem Embassy Act on October 23rd, 1995. And that act recognized Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel and called for Jerusalem to remain an undivided city. It also required the U.S. Embassy to be moved from Tel Aviv back to Jerusalem by May 31, get this, 1999. Well, the only way presidents could avoid this, avoid this law was to sign a waiver every six months declaring that the, moving the embassy would endanger America's national security. So throughout their presidencies, President Clinton, George, H, or George W. Bush, President Obama, they all used the waiver as an excuse to obey the United Nations rather than obey U.S. law. Well, the first deadline for the signing of the waiver by when President Trump came into office was June 1 of 2017. And President Trump signed the waiver, and if you understand what was going on there, he stated that he intended to move the U.S. Embassy as part of the Middle East Peace Agreement, which he, in he was intending to negotiate. Well, of course, lovers of Israel, they side with disappointment. I mean, it, and it, it looked like President Trump would be like all the rest. Hey, just in, in spite of his big promises, he's going to just continue to sign the waivers. However, on December 6, 2017, the president announced that the United States is now recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. You understand how big of a decision that was in an announcement? And that plans would begin immediately to move the U.S. Embassy back to Jerusalem. Well, we were all happy about that, right? However, 
U.S. President Joe Biden's administration is now talking about reopening a U.S. consulate in Jerusalem and to help the Palestinians. Again, American law is quite clear, everybody. I want us to understand. The U.S. Jerusalem Embassy Act repeatedly stresses the unity and indivisibility of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Remember, 1967, it actually states the city of Jerusalem was reunited during the conflict known as the Six-Day War. Jerusalem has been united, a, a united city administered by Israel. Jerusalem should remain an undivided city recognized as the capital of the state of Israel. Now, we have people and administration that's saying, nah, we're going to try to placate the Palestinians. Doesn't make any sense, does it? So, will Jerusalem be divided? Will the Palestinians get their way? What does the future hold for Israel? Well, actually the Bible's very crystal clear on what happens to the future of Israel. According to Scripture, there's going to be a peace agreement in the very near future. The peace agreement will do at least four things. Create a Palestinian state in the West Bank. Allow Jews presently living in the area of the new Palestinian state to remain there living as a Jewish minority under the new Palestinian government. The Temple Mount will be placed under a sharing arrangement so that Jews can build their third temple there without disturbing the Dome of the Rock or the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And the status of Jerusalem will remain unresolved. The city will temporarily stay under Jewish control and its status will be revisited seven years later once the peace agreement is signed. Now, I would love to be able to sit down with President Biden, his administration, and say, look, don't mess with Jerusalem. Don't mess with Israel. Because that is a God-inspired nation. God said, I will put my name in Jerusalem and on the Temple Mount 40 plus times in the Old Testament. Do not mess with that. Do not promote a two-state solution. That's land for peace. Giving up parts of the promised land for peace. It never has worked, nor will it ever work. But we know scripturally what's going to happen. The city of Jerusalem will never be divided. Israel will never divide it. There will come a time, Zechariah 14, 2, when the world governing armies come down against the battle of Armageddon, the Bible says half of the city, half of the city will be conquered. But that's not Israel's doing. That's the international community conquering that. So, this peace agreement, the Palestinian-Israeli peace agreement will be signed with much fanfare. I mean, Nobel Peace Prizes are going to be awarded. Political pundits, will they're going to contend that, hey, the core issue, feeding terrorism around the world has now been solved. Israel and the Palestinians? That's all built up in the minds of everybody from the international community and all of the false narrative that has been brought against Israel all these years. And the, the, the placing of the Temple Mount under a sharing arrangement is going to be hailed as the, the creation of a wonderful interfaith Mecca a pattern for dealing with religious strife around the world. Think about it. The international community is going to pour billions of dollars into the new Palestinian state in order to create a viable nation with its own economy, a, a, a stable government that can take its place along among the nations, right? And so the new Palestinian state is going to be granted membership at the United Nations. Think about that. This will become a source of great pride among the Palestinian people. This is coming in the very near future. But in the meantime, Jews are going to flock to their designated portion of the Temple Mount to freely pray at a place that they regard as the holiest place on earth. Plans are going to quickly move towards the building of a third temple. And the laying of the cornerstone for the new temple will be accompanied by unprecedented Jewish celebration and will be viewed with wonderment by people around the world. Think of it. The construction of the third temple 
will become Israel's number one priority. And believe me, I have lots of friends in Israel and they're looking forward to the day when that third temple will be built. The Jewish, uh, um, the Temple Institute and uh, Rabbi Yehuda Glick and many others, Gershon Solomon, all kinds of people, great friends, our guides, everybody's looking for it. And so it's Jerusalem, it's Israel. It's the Un Jerusalem, the United Capital of Israel. And it was set forth by God, not man, thousands of years ago. You don't ever want to mess with that because it's God inspired. I imagine when they set the cornerstones for the third temple. I mean, progress on its construction will be continually in the news. Every day, everybody's just going to have their TV and they're going to be riveted to watching the temple be built. Well, it's going to be completed within the first three and one half years of that seven-year agreement. Jewish authorities have estimated that with modern technology, and they've told us this, we can complete the actual construction within about one year. And while the temple's being built, religious leaders in Israel, they're going to begin preparation for the anticipated resumption of ministry in the temple. Priests are already being trained to perform the rituals required by the law of Moses. Cohens from all over the world will prepare to assume their ordained responsibilities. And when the third temple is completed, standing north of, dome, of the Dome of the Rock, its beauty is going to be breathtaking. It's going to be time for the dedication of the temple to God so that the daily rituals of worship can begin. Invitations are going to be issued to the kings and presidents, prime ministers of the world. Prominent religious leaders from all over the globe will make their way to Jerusalem. The president of the United States will be there. The pope of the Roman Catholic Church is going to be there. Without a doubt, the Antichrist, the false prophet, they're going to be in attendance even though their identities have not yet been firmly established. And the major news services of the world are going to be assigned their areas on the Temple Mount to, to televise this historic ceremony to the four corners of the earth. And it will be a, a gala such as has not been seen on earth for 2,000 years. After the obligatory remarks are chosen by the world's leaders and Israel's prime minister and the, um, the rabbis of Israel will begin the religious aspect of the dedication ceremony. And this will be, that there's going to be um, singing by the temple choir and the sounding of the shofar. Think about it. Picture all this stuff in your mind. Well, then young rabbis, they're going to enter the temple mount leading the dedication sacrifice toward the brazen altar of the center of the outer court of the temple. And an uncomfortable murmuring is going to be heard uh, rippling through those in attendance. Are they really going to do this in front of the entire world? However, it had already been explained in the program why this would be necessary. Now, this is, this is coming in the future, folks. Well, think of it. The animal is going to be placed on the altar... The killing will be done expertly and according to Halakhic guidelines. The blood's going to be captured in the basin prepared for this specific purpose. And then the priest will proceed to complete the administration as required by Jewish scriptures. And finally, the choir again will offer a rousing rendition of praise and worship to God. There will, there's going to be weeping, rejoicing, congratulations. People have waited thousands of years for this. And they're going to be offered by world leaders to the prime minister of Israel. And for days and weeks after this, rabbis are going to be interviewed on major networks of the world. They're going to explain their worship ceremonies and of the Jewish religion and explain why each one is done in great detail. The world's going to undergo a re-education in the observance of the Jewish religion. Jewish leaders are going to undoubtedly attempt to 
downplay some of the aspects of the temple worship. In particular, they will avoid speaking specifically about the daily animal sacrifices that Jewish law requires. However, once the temple rituals are in full swing, the issue is going to be unavoidable and animal sacrifices to be offered each morning and each evening. Think about that. That's a lot of bloodshed. And this, the, the daily transport of animals to the temple and the stream of blood that will flow from these sacrifices, it's going to be captured by the media and displayed for all the world to see. Animal rights activists will be undoubtedly incensed and they're going to begin to launch protest on the Temple Mountain around the world. International pressure is going to escalate at an alarming rate and the pressure for something to be done will become impossible to ignore. So, when the peace agreement is struck and the Temple Mount placed under the sharing arrangement, the United Nations or some, probably the United Nations, but at least an international body is going to be appointed to supervise the Temple Mount, that agreement, and to settle any difficulties that might arise. Well, now the offering of daily sacrifices in the temple. It's not going to be anticipated, really. But once the dispute over them arises, the Jews are going to explain that, hey, they, they are required by their God and to faithfully offer these sacrifices to Him. And it's going to be undeniable that the Jewish scriptures do mandate these, scripture, these um, sacrifices. And yet the entire world is going to be, you know, revolted by what they view as extreme animal cruelty. And the problem is not going to go away. It's going to have to be dealt with. So, everybody's going to look to the international organization that's in charge for a solution. By this time, a world leader will have risen to a level of prominence in the world community until he will be largely viewed as the leader of the world. As such people will begin to demand that he take responsibility for the Temple Mount crisis. You've got to do something right now. Well, after weeks of deliberation, the world leader, he's possibly going to call a press conference on the Temple Mount and he's, you know, in his unique way, he's going to acknowledge that the offering of the Jewish sacrifices was required by the Jews' religion. And then he's going to mention that, hey, many people of the world that, including some Jews, have been discussing the possibility that he is their long-awaited Messiah. He will have aided in getting a peace agreement signed. And, he, he, you know, and he's going to be instrumental in getting that peace agreement signed, preparing the way for the building of the third temple. Two things the Jewish people believe the Messiah will do, right? So they've been talking about it several weeks now. Well, this world leader... He's going to remind everyone the reason sharing of the Temple Mount has even become possible is because he has taught them that they are really, uh, they all really worship the same God anyway. And Muslims call him Allah, Jews call him Jehovah, Christians call him Jesus. That's what they say in the interfaith movements, right? Well, almost everyone at the press conference is going to nod in agreement. Yes. And most of them will by then have accepted all worship that all worship the same God, even though they call Him by different names, even though that's not scriptural. So the world leader, leader, he's going to continue pointing out that each of these religions also believe in a coming anointed one. Muslims call Him the Mahdi. Jews call Him the Messiah. Christians call Him Jesus. And don't you see that you not only worship the same God, he's going to say, but you are also all looking for the same anointed one, right? Well, then is going to come the blockbuster announcement. The world leader is going to declare, I have not responded to the rumors about me being the Messiah until now. However, I believe the time has come that I must respond. I am your Messiah, he will say. I'm your Mahdi. And I'm your second coming of Jesus. Consequently, these sacrifices will no longer be needed. Your Messiah has arrived. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says he will stand in the temple and claim to be God, exalting himself 
above all that is called God. So think about this. You know, for a moment, the crowd's going to stand stunned in silence like, what? But then, spontaneously, applause will break out and it's going to spread throughout the audience. God said repeatedly in the Jewish scriptures, He had placed His name on the Temple Mount. Bible's prophecies say specifically that when the Antichrist comes, He will stand in the Temple of God claiming to be God. This act of, it's absolute blasphemy. It's called, in Scripture, the abomination of desolation. The Apostle Paul prophesied this event 2,000 years ago. This is 2 Thessalonians. He said, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, the coming of our Lord, except there comes a falling away first, and the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 through 4. This last day world leader is called by several names in Scripture. In 2 Thessalonians, he's called the man of sin, the son of perdition. And it also refers to this event as the revealing of the man of sin. Most commonly today, we call this last day world leader, this dictator, this despot, the Antichrist. Jesus himself prophesied about the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24. He said, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet in Daniel 9, 27, when he stands in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. That's Matthew 24, 15 and 16 and verse 21. End Time Ministries is going to take part in warning these individuals prior to this so the people in Judea, the modern day West Bank, will have an opportunity to escape that. That's one of the things we're going to do. Once the final seven years hits, three years after that, we're going to do a door knocking campaign to every home in the West Bank, warning them to flee. And notice, Jesus said the abomination of desolation would occur in the holy place. The holy place is in the Jewish temple, right? It's on the temple mount. And Jesus also stated this event would trigger the final three and one half years called the Great Tribulation. So after this, the seven-year moratorium for dealing with the Jews, this issue, the Jerusalem issue expires, Palestinians will again insist that East Jerusalem must become their capital. That's what they're saying today and Israel, as firmly as ever, is going to refuse. Now, we know that this will set the stage. And what's going on now, honestly, many things. You UN Security Council resolutions, the, the ideology, the, the mindset of the Palestinians in the international community, it's all setting the stage for the final battle on earth, which will be fought between Israel and the world governing armies of the world international community and it's going to be fought over the status of Jerusalem. God said many times in the Old Testament, I will put my name there. And it's as if Satan said, well, if that's where you want your name, then that's where I want my name. And he's been fighting it for him ever since. And the last battle on earth, the battle of Armageddon, will be fought over this holy city, Jerusalem. It's in the news every day. And will it be divided? Not, from, not by Israel. It will be, half of the city will be conquered at the Battle of Armageddon, but Israel's never going to divide Jerusalem again. And so I wanted you to kind of have an idea of what's going on in the news today with efforts to divide Jerusalem, to bring other entities into Jerusalem. It's simply not scriptural, folks. We should not ever tamper with what God put in place. God said, I will put my name there forever. That settles it. It's scriptural. It's godly. And I don't ever want to be a part of trying to divide it. God bless you. 